Let's talk about a concussion. You see, your brain is floating inside of your skull and there's a fluid barrier between the brain and your skull. But if you hit your head hard enough, you can overcome that fluid barrier and get a concussion. It could happen here in the temporal lobe, it could happen in the frontal lobe in front, or if you get hit in a rotational movement, say like a fighter gets punched in the face, you can agitate and aggravate this area in here called the diencephalon. Now, concussions come with a bunch of different symptoms, including vomiting, anger, confusion, and loss of balance. If you've ever heard people talk about that they herniated a disc at C3, or they're bulging another disc at, down at L4, you might be wondering, what are they talking about? You see, there's different areas to your vertebral column or your spine. In your neck, we call this the cervical region, and there are seven vertebrae. In your thoracic region, it's all of these that are connected to ribs, and we have 12 of them. You have 12 ribs and 12 thoracic vertebrae. And then down here in the low back, you have five lumbar vertebrae. Some people have six, but most people have five. So if someone says L4, that's for the fourth lumbar vertebra. If they're saying uh, C7, that's for the seventh cervical vertebra. Let's use this real human skin to talk about Goosebumps, you see these little holes? Those are hair follicles, or what most people would call pores. Now obviously hairs would be inside of them, and it's crazy to think just how deep hairs penetrate into the skin. They can go all the way down into the fatty tissue. But next to all of these little pores would be these tiny little muscles called erector pili muscles. And what they do is they contract and pull on the hair follicles so the hair would stand straight up. Now, Obviously, this particular cadaver didn't really have a lot of hair on their back. That's where the skin is. But if you were to look at my arm hair, you would see that I have considerably more hair here. Now, attached to all of those are tiny little muscles, again, deep inside of the dermis, that when they contract, it pulls the hair straight up. The funny bone isn't actually a bone. It's a nerve that travels behind this inner part of your elbow called the medial epicondyle and travels down your forearm until it gets to your hand where it innervates your pinky and half of your ring finger. It's called the ulnar nerve. So if you ever hit this inner part of your elbow, you are hitting a nerve and it's sending a zinging sensation down to your hand. The reason why they call it the funny bone is because this bone here is called the humerus and well, that's supposed to be funny. This area of the brain is called the temporal lobe and this is where you process sound. It's also where you learn to comprehend speech patterns and recognize speech. And on top of all that, this is where a lot of your visual memories are processed. This might be a little surprising because I know it doesn't look like it, but there is a muscle inside of this tissue that's draping over the clavicle going towards your pecs. You see, this is a muscle called platysma. And if we look very closely, you're gonna be able to see these little fibers running through it. And you might be wondering, what does this muscle do? So the only way to do this is to look ridiculous. So go ahead and commit to the moment and go for it because you're gonna lower your jaw and flare out your neck. It's gonna look like this. Do you see all the tension that's happening there? It's like these cables are coming out. That's my platysma muscle. Platysma is a very tightening muscle that just puts all this tension on the front of your neck. I can't be sure, but I think this might be ovarian cancer. This is an ovary, except it looks nothing like an ovary should. It's extremely large and distorted and deformed, very hard to the touch. It's about as hard as a walnut. Now, I don't have the ability to perform a biopsy, so I can't be sure that this is cancer. But even if it's not cancer, you can tell that it has something up with it, especially when you compare it to another ovary. And that's exactly what this is right here. This is a normal looking ovary. It's about the size and shape of an almond. So when you compare this to that other ovary, you can tell that there was a significant issue. So I want to show you what a healthy kidney looks like compared to a not so healthy kidney. Now I can't tell you exactly what's going on with this without being able to perform tests, but as you look at it, you can see that it definitely is deformed and has a different coloration than this healthy looking kidney. Now we call this nephritis, which is just an inflammation of the kidney. And that could come from anything such as a UTI or even an autoimmune disease called lupus. What you're looking at here are four different human hearts. Now, as you're looking at them, you might notice that they are somewhat different in size. 
Now, you may have heard that your heart is about the size of your fist. So looking at these different hearts, I can get a rough idea of how large that individual was. It's not a perfect science. I don't want you to think that every single time your fist tells you the size of your heart, but it's roughly true. Now, based on that, this heart tends to fit really well with my fist. So maybe this person was close to my size and stature. But when we go to this heart right here, my fist is much larger. That tells me that this individual was likely much smaller than I am. Fun fact, but this triangle shaped bone here called the sacrum used to be five separate bones. And they all started fusing around age 16 to 18 and fully fuse by the ages 26 to 30. But down here, this little bone here called the coccyx or what most people would refer to as the tailbone, this sometimes doesn't fuse at all over your entire life. And in other people, it starts fusing very soon. You see that we had an, where this glue is shows you that this lower portion wasn't fused to this upper portion, and this upper portion wasn't fused to the sacrum. This also is variable. You can see this cadaver had four different coccygeal vertebrae, but some people have as little as three, and some have as many as five. So what you're looking at here is the stomach that has been dissected so we can see this bottom portion of the stomach called the pylorus and what I'm squeezing right here is called the pyloric sphincter and it's extremely tough. It's one of the strongest sphincters in the body and that's because the job of that sphincter is to prevent the stomach acid that's inside of this stomach from prematurely going down into the intestines and digesting them. Let's talk about your uvula. This is that soft hanging thing in the back of your throat and it acts to block off the nasal airway when you are swallowing food or some kind of drink. So you can kind of picture the tongue pushing it back, running into the uvula, and then it's going to go into this area called the pharynx or the oropharynx to be specific. It'll then run into the epiglottis which is going to get pulled down and block that airway and it's going to go down the esophagus or your food tube. Now it doesn't work perfectly every time. If you've ever laughed or coughed, it might be in this open position, and then fluid could then go up and out your nose. Let's talk about this tiny little gland here called the pineal gland. Now this thing, which is situated just above the cerebellum and the brainstem, and just below your corpus callosum, is often referred to as the third eye. Now this, the only thing that we know it secretes for sure is melatonin, which is a hormone that causes you to get sleepy. But some people speculate that it might secrete DMT or dimethyltryptamine. But that's just speculation at this point. The only thing we know for sure is it secretes melatonin to cause you to get sleepy in an absence of light. So if we're looking at these bones of your back, these are called vertebrae. And then this chunk right here, these are called spinous processes. And you can feel this if you drag your finger down your back. But if we look up here in the cervical region, you're going to see a very unique shape to the spinous process, it's split. We call that a bifid process. And what this splitting does is allows for this spinous process to run into the one inferior to it, but instead of just literally slamming into it, it starts to mold to it, kind of like a saddle would on a horse's back. This is so that when you're extending your neck, it doesn't run into it. It's a really cool property that these cervical vertebrae have. Let's talk about a few of the structures that your body can survive without. You can live with as little as one lung. So let's say we took out this left lung, the body could survive with just this right lung. The body can also survive without this. This is called the spleen. The job of the spleen is to break down red blood cells and also act kind of like a giant lymph node, but your body can survive without it. The next thing is going to be this. This is called your appendix. And the appendix definitely helps with your immune system and it likely stores probiotics or good bacteria, but it's not 100% necessary. And another thing you can live without is called the gallbladder. And in fact, this particular cadaver is missing it, which goes to show that he had his gallbladder removed at some point in his life. If you've ever dislocated a rib, that happened back here. You see the ribs physically connect to your backbones or your vertebra. And if they pop off, we call that a subluxation, and you might even be able to feel that as you would palpate or poke your back, and it might feel like a muscle knot or a big nodule. On the other hand, if your ribs separate from the cartilage that attaches it to the sternum, that's called a costocartilage separation. Now this isn't real cartilage, the soft tissue doesn't hang around as you preserve this skeleton, 
But if this bone were to separate from the cartilage, that would be much more severe. And that typically happens due to an impact or some kind of trauma to the front, such as a car crash and the seatbelt compresses it. Your liver is capable of true regeneration. It can regrow itself with as little as 25 to 35% of it. So kind of think about this much here, regrowing the rest of this organ. This is the largest organ in the body other than your skin. Now, the thing to understand though is even though it regrows, that doesn't mean it keeps its same shape. It will come back in a really bulbous, atypical type of shape. And the other thing to also understand is it will not regenerate unless you have healthy cells. See this, this is cancer. This cancer spread to this cadaver's liver from his colon. So what that means is he did not have healthy enough cells to help regenerate and will have a healthy liver. I wanna give you a really unique perspective on the connective tissue that's surrounding this muscle here called the deltoid. So I'm gonna grab it with these tweezers and as I pull it away, you're gonna see it's kinda of like cobwebs or something along those lines. But that's just a bunch of collagen fibers that are on top of the muscle. But if I go ahead and let go, I can then push it down and it's now covering the muscle again. Let's talk about passing gas. Its real name is flatulence and a good amount of flatulence is actually swallowed air that travels down your esophagus, which is behind the heart so you can't see it, goes through your stomach and then through all of your intestines until you obviously pass it outside of your body. But another significant portion of gas comes from bacteria that live inside of this. This is called your colon or your large intestine. And the bacteria that live inside of here will digest material that you're not capable of, like certain sugars from beans, for instance. And what will happen is those bacteria will then give off gases, and those gases will just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate until these muscles inside of your colon starts to contract, and eventually it will push that gas outside of your body. Some of you have an extra rib. It would happen all the way up here, coming off of this seventh cervical vertebra, and it would project towards your shoulder like this. We call it a cervical rib. Now, the only way to know for sure if you have it would be to take tests, such as an x-ray. But it's interesting to note that how much humans vary from person to person. Let's talk about why it hurts so much to get a tattoo in the here in the front of your elbow, also known as your ditch. You see, I'd call it the cubital space. And the cubital space is gonna be bordered by several different muscles, including this one, the biceps brachii. Now deep inside of here, you're gonna have several blood vessels and nerves that are gonna go ahead and supply the forearm and down into the hand. But if we look back here at the elbow, you can see this really thin piece of skin. Even though it's thin, it's gonna be loaded with nerve endings. And that, so we can kind of picture that skin wrapping its way around and covering this cubital space. Those nerve endings are gonna be telling the body, hey, we have important tissue underneath. So if you're sitting here stabbing it with tattoo needles, it's gonna hurt. You know, hey, look, we have Reno here from Saniderm. Hey, Reno, what do you do again? Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Reno Saniderm. We're the world's leading provider in tattoo aftercare. Come check us out at Saniderm. Let's talk about the shape of joints. So we're looking at a real human skeleton foot here, but I wanna focus on this second toe, and you can see it right next to this big toe right here. But if we look at this rounded portion, we call that a convex shape. And you'll notice that it has a corresponding concave shape. That's this dip, right? Kind of like this valley. And what you'll notice is that these two shapes match up very well with one another, and that allows for a lot of mobility. But not every joint in the body has that shape. We don't have to go far to see that. You can see these other ankle bones don't really have that really nice concave and convex shape. And that's because they're not gonna move in the same way that this joint is going to move. I wanna show you one of the most incredible things in the human body. You see this? This is the spinal cord and it's traveling down your back and it's being protected by bone. You see, these are the vertebrae. And it's traveling through a tunnel, which we can see right here. This is called the vertebral foramen. And as it travels down the back, you can see it kind of being protected here. All of a sudden, when it gets to your low back, it turns into something different. You see this? This is called the cauda equina, and it literally means horsetail. Your spinal cord, once it reaches the low back, just branches out into a bunch of nerve endings that look very similar to a horsetail. In my eyes, this is one of the coolest things in the human body. 
Okay, so I've seen this trend going around here on TikTok where people are getting their palm to completely flip over without rotating it here at, towards the elbow joint. The reason is because the entire thing is happening here at the shoulder and I can prove it to you. All right, so if you go ahead and feel your shoulder as you flex your elbow and then turn it this way, we call this action medial or internal rotation. You can literally feel, go ahead and do this, you can feel your humerus rotating at the shoulder. It doesn't require the elbow joint at all. So then you come back like this and flex your elbow again. And again, if you're feeling for your shoulder and you rotate it, you're getting more of that medial or internal rotation. So the reason why your palm is able to flip is because it didn't happen at all at any of the joints down here. Instead, it happened entirely at your shoulder. This is a piece of tissue that goes right down the center of your head and separates the left and right hemispheres of your cerebrum. We call this the falx cerebri. Falx means sickle, and you can see this shape does look like that grim reaper sickle or scythe. But it does, it just separates the left and right hemispheres, and it's extremely tough. It's made of a lot of collagen. And if you've ever heard of meningitis, this is one of those tissues that is infected during a meningitis infection. I want to show you the area of the brain that's responsible for processing smells. So you're looking at the bottom or inferior aspect of the brain. This is the cerebellum, and then you can see that brain stem as it's starting to turn into the spinal cord. But if we focus all the way up here, you're going to see this little stringy thing. This is the olfactory bulb as it's attached to the olfactory tract, which would connect to the olfactory cortex. The olfactory nerve, which is responsible for smell, connects to this bulb right here. And that nerve would be in the top of your nasal cavity. So as you breathe in, all these little chemicals would attach themselves to the nerve and send a signal through this bulb, through the tract, so that your brain could then process the smell. Interestingly though, we still have no idea how many smells the human brain is capable of smelling. It could be as little as 4,500, or it could be as many as one trillion. You have a big butt. You see the gluteus maximus, which is this muscle you're looking at here, is enormous in humans because it prevents us from falling forwards or backwards as we walk. And deep to gluteus maximus, we find the medius muscle. And deep to that is gluteus minimus. And those two prevent us from falling side to side. You see, if you didn't have such a big butt, you wouldn't be able to walk on two feet. So you should be proud of the fact that you have an enormous butt. I want to show you the artery in the neck that allows you to feel the pulse. So that's what you're looking at is the neck here. You can see the Adam's apple. And this is a muscle called the sternocleidomastoid. And as I reflect it back, we're going to automatically see some twine. Now, obviously, you don't come with twine. This is where the morticians and embalmers inserted the equipment to preserve the cadaver. But this is the carotid artery. See, they injected it into the carotid artery so that the embalming fluid could go through the entire body. But if you were to feel a pulse, right, and we put this muscle back on top, you could put your fingers right on this area and this artery would be filling with blood every single time the heart beats and pushes that blood through the artery. So this is what you're feeling as you feel a pulse inside of the neck. 